let me formally introduce Teresa Duncan. Uh, with over 20 years of healthcare experience, Teresa addresses topics such as insurance, coding, office manager training, and patient conversations. She has been named one of the top 25 women in dentistry and is the author of Moving Your Patients to Yes, Easy in Insurance Conversations, as well as a contributing author to the ADA's annual CDT Companion Guide. Her podcast, Nobody Told Me That, and Chew On This are valuable resources for dental lead leaders. Uh, so please be sure to check out uh, some of those uh, cool resources that uh, Teresa hosts. So Teresa, it's your turn. So take it away for us this evening. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I am so glad to be back with you all. Um, some of you, I recognize some of the names um, on the participant list, some of you from previous BioLays um, webinar. So thank you for coming back here. There are some issues with billing and coding when it comes to making sure that we have accurate revenue, right? So in our very heavy insurance world nowadays, we are running into more and more stumbling blocks, I will just say that, uh, to, to obtain reimbursement. And it's not necessarily all the carrier, it's some a little bit the employer, a little bit that we have a lot of fresh faces in dentistry doing insurance. Um, it's a lot of all of it. And I know that there are certain plans in particular that have been um, just, I think a good word is problematic this year, right? So we'll just, we'll just leave it at that. Um, my goal today is to help you code accurately so that if you were to ever um, need to appeal your procedures that you would be able to do it and hopefully successfully. Um, one important thing that I'll just say is that I cannot guarantee that you're going to get paid for everything. Um, you know, maybe 15 years ago, I could have said, listen, let's do ABC and we're going to get you paid. And probably 99% of the time it would have worked, but it's not 15 years ago. Things are very different. Plan design is very different. Um, customer expectations, patient expectations are very different. And like I said before, the workforce is very different. So um, if you've been hanging in there for a while, you've been in dentistry for a long time and uh, you're still hanging in there, I, I think it's awesome. I love this industry very much. And I hope that many of you stay for years to come. If you're newer to dentistry, yeah, it has its ups and downs, but I'm hoping that you stick it out with us. So with all that being said, um, this is an hour of laser billing and coding, so uh, it's not going to be a full like um, how to get your claims paid and all of that. You know, I have lots of webinars and classes on that, but let's talk about the procedures that you can uh, utilize the laser for, the ones that you're going to run into the most. And and one, let me just let me go forward here with uh, with advancing the slides. Um, one of my most common mottos that I'll say, I, I have a lot of Teresa-isms, I guess you'll say, um, is your documentation is going to drive your revenue. And so I'm going to give you a couple foundational key pieces that you need to be aware of whenever you do any uh, billing. So we'll we'll go over that in just a second. But one um, one thing that I want you to keep in the, the forefront is that your decisions clinical in nature, and I'm not a clinician, I'm an admin, but I'm also at my heart an office manager. My office manager brain is always out to protect my office. It's always out to make sure my doctor you know, keeps his or her license. So, so let's engage my manager brain for a little bit. Um, clinical decisions are the purview of the, the providers, the ones with licenses, the one that did all the training. Um, my job is to make sure that we're, we can get paid for it, but it also means I have to educate my providers on best practices for that. And I think that's where we have a little bit of, um, there's a disconnect there. So a lot of times doctors will take my classes and they'll say, I had no idea you needed all that documentation. You know, nobody told me that. And so I call it my, that's the name of my podcast because I hear this all the time from people. Nobody told me that about everything really. Um, and so, when the admin team is doing a really good job of letting the clinical team know, hey, I'm running into issues here, um, it would help if the templates could reflect this, this, and this, um, and then making sure that the templates match the treatment, or the clinical notes match the treatment. So um, I'll say this, and I know it sounds harsh, we just got started, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it, and I hope that you can take it to heart. Um, if you are rationalizing coding 
like you're making the code stretch to fit what you're doing, then there's a bigger issue there. So the coding should be pretty straightforward. And when we get into uh, non-covered services and all of that, we'll we'll talk about that towards the end. Um, I'd rather you tackle it from a um, holistic point of view, meaning the patient's benefits or the patient's benefits. Um, you are providing treatment and let's just see if we can divorce the two. Okay. So, but keep that in mind. We'll talk about this. I know it's easier said than done. I know I was in your shoes too. So I, I know I'm going to try to guide you through it as much as possible. So first things first, this comes as a surprise to a lot of clinicians. Um, clinical notes are actually what they're looking for as far as benefit determination. So in the past, you would, you know, you'd always hear that, you know, well, I got to write a narrative for this. Doctor, can you write a narrative for this? Um, what's really nice is that you don't have to do that anymore because your clinical notes should be complete and should tell the story of what was being done. The diagnosis, the prognosis, what was done, the materials, any patient comments, things like that. That's what we need in our clinical notes. So. Another Teresa-ism that I talk about is that I don't want you to document to the level of your carrier. So, I, you know, I have lots of handouts on insurance-friendly documentation. I don't want you to document to the level of the carrier. That's backwards. That's not, shouldn't even be a consideration. If you document to the level of your state board and whether or not you can keep your license if you go in front of a, a judge and jury, that's the level I need you to document to. If you're really good with that, complete, everything is golden, you're going to be fine with insurance. You're going to be able to you know, pass any utilizations. Now, does that mean you're going to get paid? Maybe not, but you can't control all of these crazy plans that are out there and you can't control employers who don't want to spend money and get a good plan. So you know, we can talk about that in a little bit. So make sure that you know that your clinical templates can make a huge difference in getting paid. I'm kind of reminded of way back when intraoral, radio, um, intraoral photos came out and uh, there was only a handful of you know, offices that had the cameras, but when we sent in intraoral images along with radiographs, man, the approval rating, the benefits just started flowing because I can get a lot paid with a good clear intraoral image in conjunction with the radiograph. And so um, just keep that in mind as much documentation that could paint that picture is what I want. I don't want you to send them lists and lists and photocopies of files. That's that's not the way. Um, precise to the point and comprehensive and it's possible. So the other part is I want you to um, make sure that you put in there if the patient comes to you as from a comprehensive or periodontal evaluation and they don't have those notes with you, you want to make sure that you cover yourself, that you ask the patient for that information and that they showed up to your office with no previous treatment um, history. And so uh, that helps you. I've been told that helps in a court of law, like just that you, you know, you didn't take somebody else's old notes and use that. You had your fresh notes there. And honestly, I, I can't tell you, I, I, I haven't met a doctor yet that would be okay going into court with another doctor's radiographs. I just, I don't, I wouldn't do it. Right. And I'm not even a dentist. So, okay. So let's, let's move forward here. And it's not a documentation class, but I can't talk about revenue without talking about documentation. And, you know, in my revenue classes, actually, where we talk about revenue and collections, productions, adjustments, and all of that, you know, the big fat piece of it for most offices is the insurance reimbursement. And so I can talk about cashing checks and how to collect from patients and all of that, but the doctor really has nothing to do with that piece, right? Like I'm up front just doing my thing. In the back is where I can't control what you do as far as clinical notes, I can just ask. So work with me on that, right? Okay, so I'll give you a couple little guidelines here. So documentation, the ideal time to get all that down is of course at the comprehensive or the periodontal evaluation. So you know that you know, if somebody comes in with signed symptoms, periodontal disease, it's you're you're really doing a periodontal evaluation. OK, so um, it, and a lot of offices don't even bother with 180 because which is that's the code for periodontal evaluation, not periodic, periodontal. Uh, a lot of offices don't even bother with periodontal because they say, well, they're only going to you know downgrade it to a 120 or they're not going to cover it at all. It's going to be, you know, we're going to have to write it off. Um, 
or it'll use, this is my, this is the one that I don't understand, but let's talk it through. It's going to use up one of their evaluations. I know you're right. So my job up front is to say, um, you know, you have two per year, your, your employer chose a plan that only benefits two per year. And one of those is going to be used today. And that's it. Because there are people who are going to come in often. They're a mess. You know how they are. They chip a tooth here, implants loose here. I mean, you know how it is. You have to charge for these limited evaluations, for these periodic evaluations. The fact that the patient only gets benefits for two, why does that even come into play? You know. But I hear it also from my fellow insurance coordinators. We don't want to have arguments with patients. But you know what? I didn't choose those benefits. So it is possible to educate a patient about their benefits with a big old smile on your face. And that's what I'm here to help you with. So um, templates are very good for these evaluations because the assistant can actually prompt you if you sort of forget where you are, or if you forget to record something very important. Um, what you should know about documentation is that there are guidelines that dental consultants, the ones who review claims, there are guidelines that they have to go by in order to get a claim paid. For example, um, perio charting must be complete, um, must be a clinical attachment lot level. Um, you've got to show, you've got to show that bone loss, right? But here's the thing most people don't realize. It's got to be usually, almost always, it's got to be within 12 months. So you can't send them a perio chart from two years ago. Um, it might have tens all over it, all right? However, contractually, that dental consultant cannot approve benefits for that procedure if the documentation that you provided does not meet the criteria, okay? And that's for in and out of network benefits. So um, that's, that's really on you to have um, current and acceptable documentation. Um, definitely make sure you're recording the missing teeth in the software more and more the claim forms. Um, you know, the claim forms actually pick up missing teeth in the chart and record it on the um, odontogram on the, the, the actual claim form. So we want to make sure that that's accurate too, because you don't want to uh, bill for a crown, um, I'm sorry, bill for an implant, but the tooth chart shows that it's still there, right? So that's all part of good clinical documentation. And one other issue I want to talk about is radiographs. So typically the same thing applies for, for the probing, um, say, or for the, I'm sorry, for the perio charting, like if it's very obvious that they need the work on the radiographs, but the radiographs are three, four or five years old, it doesn't make a difference. It has to be current, right? So a lot of times doctors are saying, well, I can't charge for the radiograph that day. They'll just deny it or disallow it. And, you know, I, I, when we didn't have digital radiography, and yes, that's how long I've been around, um, I would have said, okay, I get you. I know it's painful, but we have, um, we have digital now. So, you know, while you're doing an eval, um, uh, an eval and hygiene, or, you know, while you're going to um, glove up or whatever, just grab an x-ray. I mean, just, just do it. Just grab an x-ray. The sunk cost is already there. Technology's there. Um, don't beat your head against the wall for something that's really not, honestly, not that big of a deal. Now, if you had hard costs involved, like films and fixer and toner and all that, oh my gosh, I'm, I am are developer and fixer. I'm taking some of you back to the, uh, the good old days, right? Um, so the radiographs typically need to be within two years. Um, I am definitely seeing a tightening of that down to uh, 12 months. Now, here's the key with radiographs. Very easy. So some of you who are like really experienced clinicians and you're practicing at like this really high level. So you're going to kind of go, what, what is she talking about? I'm not talking to you. I'm talking about, I'm talking to people who just haven't learned yet that radiographs um, need to be, they need to be um, of diagnostic quality. So if you've got cone cuts, if you've got um, overlap, if you've got open bite, if, I mean, if the, the, um, what is it? the exposure is just off that radiograph is not of diagnostic quality. And quite frankly, the insurance carrier is going to be like, well, how did they even make a diagnosis off of this? So, and then you have to ask yourself, if I take this image with this really bad open bite into a court of law for an endo case, how good are my chances? How good do you feel about that? So we have to, I'm going to start a campaign. We have to be better with our radiographs. You have to stop whomever in your office is doing lazy radiographs 
and get them better at it. They have to be better. Um, it's not just the benefits that are going to depend on it, you know, getting paid. Um, if you ever go to court, that's going to reflect on you. So my job as a manager, protect the office. So that, in, that means protecting you. So will I talk to any hygienist or assistant that's having issues with that? Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. Because it's, um, but I'll tell you what, it's much more strong in nature and tone coming from you because you are the clinician. I mean, in cases like that, when it's a clinical, I guess, um, guidance, it's always going to be better coming from you, not from me. So let's move on here. Okay. Um, I, I'm starting off with perio. You know, Joe and I were talking about this earlier. The, the, the fact is the most amount of questions I get in my coding classes circle, they're, they're around either um, crown buildups, secondary insurance, or perio. And perio, depending on you know, the area in which carrier is dominant, you can see, I can tell which one's going to be more, um, more discussed in the class. Uh, so let's just talk about perio. Um, one thing I want you to do, and this will increase your revenue because what's going to happen is you're going to have some level of consist consistency. Your team is going to get calibrated on what they expect to have. When I, as the insurance coordinator, go to submit your claim, I know that these pieces of information are going to be in that chart because that's what we've all agreed to. The one thing that is harder to agree on is the path of the patient through perio. It's hard when you have um, hygienists with different um, styles. You have doctors that are aggressive, some not aggressive, um, conservative. I mean, it's just, it's up to, uh, and each individual dentist um, and hygienist has their own style, That that's it. But and they'll find, you know, a good place for them. But sometimes you have such a mismatch. It's really hard on the whole team because patients will tend to settle with who they want to go with. Right. And we don't want that. We want we want um, everybody to be calibrate, calibrated across the board. Um, I will just let's just touch on this. I, I want you to have a meeting with your team. Um, first, doctors, I would do this with your uh, hygienist, your hygiene team. Um, talk about this trace the patient through the office if they have periodontal issues. Okay, so where where do we go from at all of these places? And you can do flow charts. I mean, there's lots of stuff out there. I think um, ADHA may have something like that. My friend, Rachel Wall, um, she has lots of resources, inspired hygiene for this. So she's, I know she's got something like this, but at which point do, do you zig and other people zag? So identify that. And then the other piece of it is, when you get some sort of consistency, right, you're going to have a team meeting and bring in your manager beforehand so he or she isn't blindsided. You're going to have a team meeting. And this is what the expected path is for patients in your office. Everybody knows. The assistant knows. Everybody that's scheduling. The insurance coordinator knows. And so you have a really good protocol in place for perio. Do you revisit it? Sure, because technology and all of that maybe. Maybe there's just lasers everywhere and you start adapting lasers into um, your day-to-day -day on even more than you already are. So there's just lots to do with this. I recommend doing this once a year. And then that way everybody is reminded of um, how important this is, but also we definitely have a lot of new people coming in. And I'm gonna guess that uh, you're gonna have at least one new person, at least one new person within a 12 month period. So it's always good to catch up with them. Um, and, and also, People come from other offices and sometimes they do things really well in other offices. And so you can benefit from that, but you're not going to benefit unless you don't ask. All right. So I'm sorry, unless you ask, not don't ask, unless you ask. Okay. So let's move on here. Um, one thing that uh, BioLay's customers have been able to um, really sink their teeth into is the fact that they have protocols all put in place for them. So this is the repair um, peria protocol. Dr. Lau does a great job coming up with these. So the the codes that you see on there are not Dr. Lau's. He's, he kind of just said, hey, take this and, and give the codes out. And I, I did. So you have these. Um, I do want to say, though, that the um, the fourth bullet point on the pre-surgical phase, I need to go back and change that because new for 2023, starting in 2023, I'm going to have new codes in there because uh, internal images is now replaced with different codes. So um, and I you know what? It, everything changes. Right. So. OK, so. I went through the protocol and gave you all of the codes that you would need for that um, if you were to uh, utilize this protocol. So I hope that that helps. Uh, one other thing I want you to know is that um, for most of the procedures that I'm gonna go over here, 
uh, there's a there's clinical protocols already um, in place. And so uh, the, the website has all of those. So if you're wondering like, what's the protocol for, you know, phrenectomy and, and, you know, cr clinical crown lengthening, hop on over to the website or email, you know, or throw something in the chat and hit up Joe and he'll figure out a way to get it to you. Um, but there's lots of resources on the website for that. Uh, this is suggested documentation, again, from BioLays on, you know, what to do for laser usage. I'm not going to go through each one because we'll be here all night. Um, I just want to uh, point this out down here, the laser setting, I don't know if you can see that, but the, um, the laser setting bullet down at the very bottom there. So when I see this, uh, my manager brain just goes, I have no idea what that is. And what I was really lucky, I had a doctor when I said, um, I really have no idea what you're talking about. He would stop and he would explain the procedures and I, I have to give it to him. He's the reason why I understand a lot of clinical situations and why I love really what dentistry so much. Uh, so when I see something like this, that makes me kind of go, Ew, what is that? There's got to be other people that feel the same way. So um, I'm going to challenge you dentists and hygienists to talk to your team, you know, pull up a, at a team meeting, it doesn't have to be the focus of it. I mean, an hour of lasers is not something that a new assistant is going to want to listen to. But little snippets, you know, hey, this is what this means. And then this template, and this is why we need wavelengths and all that kind of stuff. I mean, a new person coming in is going to be like, wavelengths, what's that about? Learning about what the laser can do is super cool. So um, don't forget that. Don't forget that new people really don't understand like everything that's going on. So take the time, not just with lasers, um, things like root canals. Why are you doing this? Why on the upper are you sending them out? Because that, that, hidden canal is going to catch you. You know, you're worried about that. Little things like that make your team stronger and they're able to discuss things more confidently with your, with your uh, patients. And, and you will see that that makes a huge difference. So the other, so let's just keep going with peri and then we're going to go into other stuff. Um, the AAP uh, has new periodontal guidelines. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that most of you have seen this by now. And if you have a, a hygienist in your office, I'm hoping that this has been the topic of conversation. Um, if you have a hygienist in your office and you go back and you say, hey, what's this about new staging and grading? And they look at you with a blank stare. Um, you know, two years ago, I would have said, oh, you need to send her here or send him over here to learn about it, listen to this podcast. We're about ready to start implementing it like as standard of care. Um, and there's really no excuse for any hygienist. I don't, I don't care if they took off during all of COVID. There's no reason why um, anybody involved with perio has not heard of the staging and the grading. So if you, for some reason, just got somebody who doesn't have that information, you're going to go to aapperio.org and look that up. Now, the handout that um, we'll make available to you is going to have these two and the next one um, on uh, in full pages. So I did the handout with the PDF of the slides, and then these are actually in full pages so that you can print them out and use them in a team meeting or go to peri.org and go to that section and you can print them out because I just took them from there. Um, fantastic uh, information to go over. And also you'll start to see where the holes are in the clinical information. So. I did a whole series. I've been doing BioLays webinars for a while. And one of the things that I love is that uh, the participants are always like, okay, well, that's great. But what about this? And it's good because it keeps me on my toes. So I was talking about staging and grading. Oh, gosh, it's got to be last year. And uh, somebody messaged me and said, well, that's nice. But what do we do with our templates? Because you're telling me I need templates. And I said, all right, well, let me give you some templates then. So feel free to take these, insert them into your templates for anything perio, uh, so that you have this in your notes and you can rely on it. So I did, um, I ran this by a lawyer that I talk to all the time and he was like, yeah, that's good. So <laughs> got the stamp of approval there. So feel free um, to use that. The most important part is that when the patient comes in, you're assessing what stage they are, their perio disease. And then as um, you treat them and as they progress through, you know, over time, you're assessing how um, the disease path and, and whether or not it's accelerating or, or you're treating it, you're keeping it at bay. And that's the grading. Okay, so that's the important thing. Definitely, definitely worth a lunch and learn. So let's talk about 
SRP. I want you guys to get paid for SRP, but I will tell you it's getting harder and harder nowadays. Um, those two images, I've been using them for probably 10 plus years because I can't find better ones that um, illustrate it better than this. Like these are the same teeth. And with my integral image, I can get that pay. I, you know, they were able to get this pay. This is a doctor out in Colorado. Um, they were able to get that pay because the radiographs, look at it. It's, it's bone loss, but it's not, but, but look at the intraoral image. Oh my goodness. So that being said, I hope that that drives home the point that intraoral images are wonderful and I want you to use them. So let's put a pin in the first bullet point. I'll come back to that in a second. Typically SRP, um, you have a 24 or 36 month frequency limitation, always, always is going to require perio chart and the most comprehensive radiographs that you've got. So FMX is good. Pano, not so much. Pano does, is not really of diagnostic quality. Uh-oh, got something in my throat. Is not really of diagnostic quality as it pertains to perio. So you will typically not, you will typically get a request for um, FMX for bite wings, bite wing series that, that can help too. Um, but clinical attachment loss is what they're looking for on the perio um, charting and then also on the radiographs. Okay. So I also would love for you to get in the habit of noting seat and dismissal time. You know, there's a lot, I used to not see this, but now I'm seeing it in some of the clinical guidelines for um, insurance carriers, because I'm that person that reads them and enjoys them. Um, I'm starting to see that they're actually making recommendations like um, one quad of dentistry uh, should take about 30 to 45 minutes, which is, you don't, you haven't really seen that before. And the reason why, whenever I see something new, I always ask myself, why, what, what would they, what is that for? Is that paving the way for something? Well, there are offices out there that definitely abuse 4341, 4342. I mean, that's fraud, unfortunately, is a fact of life. And so I think I know what's happening is that fraud uh, fraud investigations have been centering in on easy codes to look in the chart and see if their things are bad, right? And this is one of them. So I just am a fan of noting when they seated them and when they were dismissed from the chair. Um, every uh, attorney that I talked to about this, and I, I would say not all of them, I would say the four that I talked to about this, um, we're fine with this. They actually liked this. If you do any kind of sedation, this is going to be what you have anyway. So why not just add it into your chart, right? Um, and then that way, and I'll, honestly, if you bring on an associate, you're going to see that the seat and dismissal time pretty big, right? New associate coming out, you know how it is. They're very slow. Um, two years later, have them look at their seat and, you know, seat and dismissal times. It's pretty cool to see that they really have gotten so fast and efficient. But going back to insurance, it may come up in an audit. And so just, you know what, just add it to your templates. So the first bullet point, I told you I was going to come back to it. And this really applies to all of what I'm going to talk about today, tonight. Um, I want you to involve the patient ahead of time by having conversations with them, firm, firm and friendly conversations with them about their coverage. And so what I typically will say, especially for SRP, is I'm going to try my hardest to get this paid, Mrs. Smith. I'm going to send it in, lots of documentation. I'll go ahead and send it in. Um, I have found that there has been a lot, I've, I'm dealing with a lot more denials in regards to scaling and route planning. And now I'm not lying on that. In my experience, I have had that. I hear many of you have had that and you probably have seen that. So if you, if you are not experiencing that, don't say that, obviously. I don't want you to lie, but I'm going to guess that most of you have this situation. All right. So I'm going to say to them, you know, I, I just know that I've been having some issues with them. And I, what I will do is I will appeal it. Now, if I have to call you, Mrs. Smith, that means that I have exhausted all of my options. So if I put up the bat signal and I have to call you, um, that means I really need your help. I will likely need you to go to HR um, and have them call the carrier and maybe um, step in for me. A lot of times patients will say, um, well, call me before then, you know, if I can help before then. And then some patients will say, sure, whatever. But when I do put up the bat signal, it's not a surprise to them. And I, you, when I started doing this, when I started prepping them that I might need their help, the, um, I would get calls back. I would get emails back because before then it was like, oh, you said you're going to get it paid. So get it paid. You know how it is. So I always enlist the patient's help um, when it comes to getting paid. And this can apply to not just SRP, but to other things. So let's talk about some of the periodontal clauses that you're going to see out there. And these, uh, 
these two dogs just crack me up. I kind of feel like uh, the white dog has some gum disease and the breath is kicking, right? And the black dog is like, oh my gosh, <laughs> don't come near me now. Um, and, and we know that it, it, our, the our admin team, um, I'm going to guess, is probably just as good at diagnosing perio as you are because we get the breath, right, when they walk in. So um, it's always fun to, uh, I used to say, I, I, you know, Mrs. Jones is ready. Um, you want me to bring her back? And I would say, and by the way, I'm going to put 10 down that she's got like six millimeter pockets, you know, so we would have some fun with it. And let's be honest, dentistry, sometimes you've got to have fun, right? Okay, so here are some common periodontal clauses. Now, these are what are called benefit limitations. You have a cost containment measure. So listen to what I'm saying. Your plan has a cost containment measure. Your plan has a clause. Your plan does not allow benefits for this. Your plan, do you hear what I'm saying? Your plan has a cost restriction um, in place. What I'm saying here is that these are not clauses that we came up with. These are clauses that carriers came up with. And I'll tell you, carriers, you know, I work with them a lot too. I work with ADA and carriers and they'll tell me, we, we'd be happy to carry, you cover all of that. But the premium on that plan is going to be astronomical, right? So there's got to be some give and take. And I want you to look at it from a business point of view. So with that being said, everything that I list on here, I'm not going to go through each one of them, but you will see here, these are, these are clauses I come across quite often. There is nothing none, not one of those bullet points is rooted in any kind of clinical data, studies, anything. They're all strictly cost containment measures, benefit limitations, clauses, um, or cost clauses, you know, things like that. Like you will, you will use these terms, start using these terms more and more. Don't say, well, insurance didn't pay or, oh, they didn't pay and we can't do this. And we, you know, they, they, they won't pay us for that. That's not the way. It might be true, but that's not the way. What I want you to say is um, your employer has selected, your employer's plan, your employer chose a plan that has cost containment measures like this. I'm going to try to get it paid, but I may run into a cost containment measure that your employer has selected. Do you see the difference? So, and, and if there's any carriers listening, I don't think I'm saying anything out of line because this is exactly what the employer selected. So I'm being what I call transparent try to be very transparent in all things. And this especially, because put yourself on the other side as a patient, I want to know if I could have chosen a better plan or if the plan I have, what the limitations are so that I can plan for it. You know, um, that lots of people have HSAs that they can tap into. Okay, so that's a whole different conversation. Um, but I just want you to see all of that in there that we kind of accept as clinical guidelines. And I see this all the time offices will use these as their clinical guidelines. Well, we only schedule two quads in one day. Um, we only schedule, it's always two weeks between appointments. It's always one week between appointments. It's always, we see them three months plus one day. These are all because you got used to these being guidelines, but they're not. They're just cost containment measures. You, doctor, clinically, you do you do what you think is best for the patient, all right? And then the, let the benefit chips fall where they may. Benefits are great because it gets people in the door. Lots of studies on that, right? People with benefits come in much more than people without benefits. That's not even contested. But that doesn't mean that those benefits, once they walk in the door, that those benefits become your 10 commandments. So let's not do that. All right, so uh, let's move into gingivectomies. Um, and I, I was joking, I was joking with Joe on this because um, <laughs> there's some bad stock images out there, right? So, and I just found this, this is one that was for a gingivectomy. And I was like, well, I guess that that kind of counts that the lots of soft tissue there, it's just funny. Um, so for gingivectomies, um, one thing that you should know, and, and what I did, I structured with these um, slides is I, I'm talking about the different procedures that you could do. But I am also giving you what I see as the most common documentation um, requirements in all of these uh, provider benefits, or I'm sorry, the um, processing menus. So there are people out there that love reading this kind of stuff. I have a small group of people that um, I really adore because they like looking at this stuff and we kind of share. I know Delane's on the call, shout out Delane. I just, she's my coding uh, sister. So. Here's the thing, I read those so that you don't have to, okay? I read those so you don't have to, so that what I'm doing is I'm, I'm taking the most conservative um, clause and I'm applying it here, okay? So some plans might 
just require, you know, um, four millimeters of attachment loss, whatever, but I'm giving you what I see the most so that you can at least be prepared for what's out there. Now, if I'm seeing in all of the documentation, so follow me here, if I'm seeing all the documentation for gingivectomies, I'm looking at all these different requirements, MetLife, United Healthcare, Emeritus, whatever, they all say five to eight millimeters attachment loss is commonly required. Will I go to my template and make sure that there's a how many millimeters of attachment loss is there? So not just the periochar is going to show it, but I'm going to put on there, you know, there's in certain pockets, there's, you know, eight millimeters here, or six millimeters here. I'm going to put that in the clinical template because that will remind me to write something about it. And I'm speaking as a clinician, um, which I'm not, but you know what I mean? So I'm going to use that to have that um, note in there. And if it doesn't apply, then I'm just going to backspace, delete that out of the template. Okay. So, but I'd rather have it in there. So it prompts me. So um, definitely you will see, and I know this just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And again, it's a cost containment measure, not necessarily a clinical guideline. Uh, most of the plans are going to reimburse if it's done on a different date as the crown prep. And, um, you know, I, I have doctors, doctors are funny. I, I just love you all, but you'll, you'll come up to me and you go, why, why? And I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel your pain. So, okay, so let's keep moving. Um, you know, so uh, anatomical crown exposure. Okay, so, and crown lengthening, right? So um, I thought it'd be fun to show you a picture of this uh, paleo caveman they dug up, um, 14,000 years old. And I'm thinking, wow, look at that crown lengthening and uh, all of that. It's, gosh, it'd be so much easier if there wasn't all that soft tissue in the way. So I thought that would give you a little bit of a chuckle. So, okay, so let's talk about... Um, the crown exposure here. So typically, of course, not reimbursed on the same day as restorative procedure. And I, I can hear that. I mean, there's some healing that goes on, but honestly, they're not going to reimburse it anyways. I don't see this reimbursed hardly. I, I really just don't. Um, and I look for it all the time. It's kind of like the white whale. If I see it, I'm going to be, Ooh, I got to get that. I got to find out which policy and spread the word, but I just don't see it. So that's where you're going to let the patient know, you know, in my experience, we don't get this covered very often. Uh, we're going to try, but we just don't get this covered very often and let them know that you're going to do everything you can, but you're already priming the pump that they're going to expect that it's not going to be a covered service. Okay. So just prepare uh, the patient. So, and, and transparency, 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 transparency. I'm just going to, I hope that you, you get that from my conversations with you tonight. So clinical crown lengthening. Okay, well, so again, I went and read a whole bunch of manuals and um, the most common was must include alveolar bone recontouring. So when I see that in most manuals, am I gonna adjust my template to say alveolar bone recontouring and then a line, you know, so that you can describe, you know, where and, and any other clinical notes you wanna put. And again, if it doesn't work, then you're just gonna take that out. So um, I, I have a, a really good friend who's a periodontist, manages a periodontist office, Beverly, and she, her templates are huge. And by the time they get done, they're just, you know, they delete what they don't need. I'd rather have that than have to sit and type up every single one. Um, templates are a godsend. Okay, so um, evidence of the decay, uh, you know, that extends below or near the alveolar crest, make sure that you note that. Intraoral images, your radiographs are all gonna help. Um, this is hit or miss. So I, I typically, it's probably 50-50. I mean, I know that's a scientific term, right? 50-50. Um, and my appeals on crown lengthening, I will say, you know, I used to be 100% on most appeals. I'm not going to lie. Um, it's harder now. So I would say for cl clinical crown lengthening, it's a lot harder for me. Um, and, and if the patient is already prepped for it, I'll do one appeal. And then, you know, it's, I'm not going to waste my time on that. So I'm just going to prep the patient. You'll notice in some of the uh, codes that I'm going to go over that you have this little uh, medical billing circle. Uh, when I have that up there, I will tell you um, that what that means is that it's a possibility that you could bill this to medical, but I will say I am not a medical billing expert. I'm, I'm terrible at it. Um, you, would, you would absolutely get audited if I taught you how to do medical billing. So you don't want me to do it, but I do have people. Um, at the end, I'll put on, the, uh, on a slide of who you can call to help you because I just would not be the one. So let's go back to dental. So the necessary documentation obviously is it includes whether or not bone was augmented or removed. That is the, that's the core of it. Okay, so we need to make sure that that's involved. Now the period, the charting, the period charting and the radiographs, you know, this is where 
um, bite wings and FMX, um, you know, vertical bite wings and FMX really, really do well here. So I, I actually um, get a lot of claims paid when I've got like extra x-rays, if that makes any sense. So, um, and of course the intraoral images. Uh, one thing that I'll tell you, I didn't mention this with scaling and root planing is uh, I, I learned this from a very, um, one of my very oldest clients. Um, the treatment coordinator was amazing. And what she would do is uh, they would, the hygienist would probe, you know, get the perio charting done and, you know, pockets and all the kinds of bleeding. That's when she would whip out the intraoral image or intraoral camera. And she took pictures of bleeding spots, bleeding spots all over the place. And it was great because I, they, we could send them into the insurance carry, but it was really great from a, um, from a patient education point of view, because when the gums were healthy, tightened back up and they didn't bleed like that, it was a great comparison point. So, uh, you know, I'm telling you, intraoral images, I love them. Okay, so then I see this a lot too. Crestal bone level should be greater than two millimeters below this, the um, sentin enamel junction. I, you know what I'm talking about, sentinel enamel junction. I think I probably have it. Um, here's something that's very interesting. Um, sometimes even with 4910s, getting 4910s paid, uh, and they're gonna ask you for a history of previous perio um, treatment, the SRP or the osteosurgery. And sometimes the patient doesn't bring that in. And that's why it's important to note, you know, patient came in with no records. Um, it's an estimate. So they do usually request, you know, when, when they had this work done. And I can tell you with confidence that when you put in the notes, patient states that she had scant, she had this procedure done well over five years ago, or Patient states that crown is over 12 years old. That's all they need to make the benefit determination um, on that criteria. They don't expect you to have exact dates unless that patient, you know, was in your office or the, the charts right in front of you. So um, definitely patient statements are so important to have. Ask them how old these things are. Ask them how long it's been since and just make sure that that goes in there. Um, I will tell you that having an assistant that understands this is super helpful. Um, some of the best documentation I've seen, it's because the assistant was on his or her game and it's fantastic. The one thing about osteosurgery, I'll tell you is that um, a lot of times, you know, you wanna go straight to osteosurgery. You wanna skip scaling and replaying because it just needs to go there. Um, there are benefit plans out there that will not provide benefits if they did not go through that step of traditional SRP. So in that situation, you know, that it is what it is. You know, the patient's responsible for it. It's, it's a bummer. It's a bummer, but the patient's responsible for it. You could do two things. Um, you could ask them for the alternate benefit of the scaling and root planing code. That does not mean that you're changing the code. You're still submitting your 4260s, um, 61s, but you're saying, can we at least have the alternate benefit of the scaling and root planing code? It'll be much, much less. And maybe you don't get it, but I've had a couple of successful appeals using that criteria. That's a new use of alternate benefit for me. And it's been, I've been surprised that I've been able to get that, that covered. So I love it. Um, the other piece of this is that it gives you another opportunity to say to the patient, I, you know, I really thought this was going to be covered too. I'm, surprised, I'm just as surprised as you are. Your employer unfortunately chose a plan that just doesn't cover that or, you know, chose a plan that was restrictive in this area. And that, and I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. And that's really all you need to do. Don't go tripping over yourself to give discounts, you know, or courtesies. Don't, don't do that. You did the work and it cost you money to provide that work. Okay. So let's talk about laser bacterial reduction, LBR. I get this all the time, but there's no code to describe it. So we have to use our $49.99. Um, typically if you're in network, they're going to bundle it up and tell you that you can't charge for it. If you're out of network, you're like, whatever, I'm still going to charge for it. Uh, that's the beauty of being out of network. But I realize many of you um, aren't out of network. In fact, most of you are in networks. And so um, I know that we have to be conscious, uh, very conscious of this because uh, you might charge for it and then have to write that off. And that just, that hurts. You know, you're as speaking from an admin who's had to do that and help people do that. I don't like writing off. I want you to get paid lots of payment. Um, and that really hurts. But it is what it is with an in-network um, contract. And so, and I know some of you are like, but what about the form? Hold on. So <laughs> we'll get to that in a second. Um, most of the carriers have 
really deemed lasers to still be investigational in nature. That was, those are some of the terms that I see. Um, and it's not, you know, the documentation's there, the studies are there, you see it with your own eyes, you use it in your practice. Um, it's just, you know, if you feel strongly, like I do, that the manuals are not up to date with this type of thing, talk to your patient, just say, you know what, the insurance carriers do not feel that these are, you know, ready for prime time. They still call them investigational. Meanwhile, there's tons of, of laser companies out there. I have a company that's great. This laser is fantastic. And it, I see the results. I would say that to them because why not? They're not going to hear it from anyone else. They're going to hear it from you. Nobody's going to stop them in the street and say, hey, you know how your insurance doesn't cover lasers? Well, you know, that's wrong. Nobody's going to do that. You have to do that. So um, I'm going to urge you to just be a little bit more open about the benefits that people have. Don't slam them because patients typically do not have control over the benefits that they have. The employer picks it, but being insurance friendly and translating to patients what benefits mean, that's how you're going to keep people coming back. Um, trust me on this. I've worked with tons of offices that do that. So uh, your phrenectomies, you know, uh, we had uh, the 7960 was our catch-all and that went away. And now we have more granular, more specific codes. There is um, some documentation, some, some clinical guidelines on this on the website. I mentioned that there's a, you know, um, the protocols. And so go look for that. Um, if you are billing to medical, the one thing that I've heard over and over again from um, usually is pediatric practices that are billing medical, they will tell me um, that if they have these key phrases on here, interferes with proper oral care or interferes with the seating of a prosthetic, that's not going to be a kid, but causes issues with speech or mastication, um, you're going to get some coverage. Now, an adult, obviously, you're going to get some coverage, but medical billing, um, it, learn how to do it before you do it, okay? It's, it's, it's not for the faint of heart. It's not easy. I'll tell you, it's not easy. So uh, proceed with caution. Okay, so one thing I want to tell you about is that there is an evaluation code that to me is like so criminally underused, and I want to talk to you about it. D0171. Some of you are like, what is this code? I've never heard of it. It's been around for a couple of years. It's just that we fall into habits, right? So you've done all these procedures that I went through. I kind of ran through them, right? You probably brought a few back for a reval. So let's talk about your scaling and replaning. You probably brought them back um, to do another perio charting and another assessment. And you were like, well, what can I charge this? You know, what is this? 171 is the perfect code for that. Do, did you have um, a pretty heavy extraction um, and, and lots of, you know, cutting and all that, and you want to bring them back in just to make sure everything is okay? 171 is that. Anytime that you had a post-operative visit from a procedure, 171 is appropriate. Does it eat up an evaluation code? Yeah, it does. And so we just tell the patient that that's what's going to happen and collect. And so, you know, try to, try to do, you know, do this whole thing where, what would Teresa do? Teresa would smile and say, I'm sorry, you've already used your two evals that your employer allows. So unfortunately this one's going to be out of pocket. It will be $60. And then I'm going to smile. How do you want to take care of that? That's how you do it. You do it confidently and you do it with a smile and your patients actually are just going to fall in line. Most of them, most of them, I can't promise you, they all will. You all know who's not going to fall in line. Um, but I want you to explore using 171 more because I'm going to guess that you provide lots of look-see evaluations where it's just a no charge. And uh, boy, are you losing money because your disposables, your PPE, it's all different now. Your overhead, everything's different now. COVID and this recession, everything is different. So uh, one thing that I, I find very interesting, so uh, let me just tackle the big one, biopsy and excisions, typically not going to be reimbursed. Medical billing is where you're going to um, get some, some traction there. Um, hemostasis, I, I'm, this is fascinating to me, honestly, and I, I just think this is something that I would share with the rest of your team. Um, lasers are great at stopping blood flow. So sometimes you know, you will be, we talked about this earlier, Joe and I, in our pregame, um, you know, if, if you're doing a crown and you've got a bleeding spot, it just won't stop, you know, pull out your laser, um, you know, stop that bleeding and, and your reps, you know, your reps and your clinical guides, your doctors that you um, work with, with biolase, they'll tell you this, you'll figure that out when, you know, you need to do it, but 
from an admin point of view or from a new clinical person, you know, your assistant, a lot of times that doesn't make sense to us until we see it. It's super cool, right? So that's what I'm talking about. Explain why you do what you do. Now, anytime that you do that and you're like, oh, I should bill for that. Well, you could. It's going to be a 999 code um, and 999 codes are useless, let's be honest. So we submit it. There's a fee attached to it. And then we end up not, you know, it's not going to get paid. So any 999 codes are just, they're tough. They're tough. Um, but it's typically included with the procedure. And I just think, honestly, it's it's going to help you be a better clinician. I know when I was an assistant, I don't know how many times we sat there and just waited for a spot to stop bleeding, stop bleeding. So this would have been much better, right? So, and then, you know, troughing around crowns, all that kind of stuff is perfect. So at any rate, see, I get excited about this stuff, right? And I'm not a clinician. So typically denied, this is my list of, yeah, good luck. <laughs> this is my good luck list. Um, you're typically not going to see this. However, medical, I should have my little um, circle here. Medical um, is very commonly um, billed to for, for these procedures. So let me get to, because I know this is going to be the biggest, oh gosh, we're at 854. Um, this is going to be the biggest question that I get. So hopefully I can answer most of them right here. Can they just sign a form? So you want to do laser disinfection. You want to um, charge an upgrade. You want to utilize different materials. Um, and you just say, well, can I just have them sign a form? So if you're at a network, you don't worry about this. Okay, so let me, speaking to my in-network people, can they just sign a form? So a lot of times, yeah, they can sign the form, um, but you've got to check your carrier contract because sometimes the form means nothing. And that's because of the contract you signed. You signed and agreed to that, right? So um, unfortunately, you're kind of, um, you're stuck, right? What about this form that everybody talks about where you can, um, it's a HIPAA right to restrict disclosure form. And what it is, is you have it, have them sign it and you don't submit to the carrier. The patient agrees that you're not going to submit to the carrier. They're going to pay in full. So hazard here. So I, yes, you, there is such a form. Um, it applies to that day and it applies to all services on that day. You can't pick or choose. Problem is the patient has to pay in full for the day services, no payment plans or anything like that. It negates that whole thing is part of HIPAA, okay? So I don't make up the rules. Unfortunately, I have to translate them for you and, and tell you about them. Um, and this is what this is what gets me. It can be revoked at any time. And I, countless horror stories, you can imagine I hear all of the, the horror stories. I never hear the, oh man, I had all my claims paid today. I don't get those stories. Um, I've heard the horror stories and been on some calls um, where the, the carrier has said, you know, Mrs. Jones, you you signed a form. And so all you have to do is revoke it. And that counts. And the patient's like, so if I revoke it, I don't have to pay anything. Yeah, you don't have to pay anything. And by the way, they actually have to give you money back because you shouldn't have paid anything. That is a terrible phone call to listen to. It was painful. Um, and I've heard that a couple of times and I hear countless stories about it. So I understand that there is that form available. Um, Rick Garofalo, Psych Practice Mechanic, um, go there and look for the do not bill insurance form and read the instructions so that you know what you're getting into. Um, there's also uh, on there's lots of resources on his site. The handout that um, I made available in a PDF, um, this actually, if you click on it on your computer, it's going to be hyperlinked. I hyperlinked a bunch of different stuff for you. So that being said, and um, let me just say that there are definitely Schools of thought out there where, well, we'll just create a dummy code, um, you know, just our own internal code, and um, they won't be covered by insurance, and so they won't send it into insurance, and they won't recognize it, and whatever, or we're just doing an internal code, and um, don't submit it to insurance. The patient will never know any different. It's a non-covered service, so we should get paid for that. I hear this a lot, and I it never ends well, so I'm just going to say buyer beware. When you hear any kind of advice on the internet, let's be honest. Um, just, yeah, be careful. All right. So I've been, I've consulted with a couple on strategy calls. I've had a couple strategy calls with people who've been burned by this. So that being said, your documentation, as always, is going to drive your revenue. Please remember that because that's super important. And then I want you to take this sheet home. And this is new. We didn't have this last year during the BioLays um, webinar series that I, I did. Um, I'm, I'm adding this in because I'm, I'm realizing with all the new people coming into dentistry that it's tough for them to say what comes naturally to some of us old timers. So I want you to get in the habit 
of saying, using these terms and just try it out, try it out, try it out. Um, you know, role play, everybody hates role play, but I tell you what, role play is great because you can, once you get the initial laughter out of the way and the, the awkwardness, you do start improving on the verbal skills. So just remember the tone in all of these. Your plan doesn't provide benefits for it. Your employer selected a plan that does not have benefits for that procedure. Um, I'm going to do everything I can to obtain benefits, but I have found that with your plan in particular, um, I'm having issues or I, I never am able to get benefits paid. Um, I am happy to talk to your employer if they're interested so that I can help him or her pick a better plan. Why not, right? So um, take this slide and use it in a, a, a another huddle, you know, like a, a morning huddle, um, whenever you huddle or use it in a team meeting and just kind of practice on each other. Um, I, I hope that you utilize everything that I've given you today because that's, that's what I want. So some other resources for you. Um, my book, yes, is Moving Your Patients to Yes. You can find it on the website or Amazon, uh, my website or Amazon. And it's all about insurance conversations. Um, do for, I, I got to work on that for 2023. I got to do uh, financial conversations and that's going to be fun. Um, CDT 2023, the coding companion is huge. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger with all sorts of scenarios. Um, I'm actually, I, I'm loving it. I, you know, this is what I, this is, see how fun I am. I have the, the book here. You can't see it because of the, the fake background, but um, I will tell you, I, coding nerds, if you've got one in your office and that's the kind of thing that makes him or her excited, hold on to that person because they're going to make you a lot of money, right? They're going to help you with your revenue. Um, every year I do a coding update with all the new CDT codes. And so you're welcome to register for that, get the replay or attend live. And so I just wanted to make sure that you had that. And medical billing, remember I said medical billing, don't call me. <laughs> so I'm hoping that you utilize this. And I'm hoping that you all join me in Orlando, um, February 3rd through 4th, two days of insurance, two days of nothing but medical and dental insurance. And for some of you, if you like recoiled in horror, I get it. That's okay. It's not your crowd. Um, but if you're like, Ooh, really? Come on, come on down. Come on down. We'll, we'll see you. Um, so these other people are fantastic. And um, I hope to see you at some point. And I know that we have in April, BioLase is planning something pretty fun, um, tongue ties and tequila in Scottsdale. So save the date. I, I think April 21st and 22nd is what Joe told me. Um, save the date for that because how much fun does that sound? And I've been told it's not all tongue ties. So there'll be other, other stuff too. So if you feel like listening to more of me, and yes, I'm going to do Q&A after this, um, I do have two podcasts there. Uh, Medicare Advantage. So dentists, you're going to be like, why is she talking about this? But my admin team who are listening, you all know Medicare Advantage has become a big issue, right? So there's two podcasts that I did, one with Colleen Huff, one with Delane Glogie, um, where mm -hmm. they talked about Medi Medicare Advantage. So you can go back in my Nobody Told Me That and look at that. Remember how I said... Um, perio, you need to get your hygienist calibrated and talking in the same language. Um, it's not released yet. It'll be out, I think, next week. But I just interviewed Rachel Wall of Inspired Hygiene. And we did nothing but talk about how to calibrate your hygiene and doctor team and then distill that down to the admin. So that being said, I know Joe's like, oh my God, she talks so fast. I know, I do. Um, <laughs> I want to thank Bylays. I want to thank Joe for um, inviting me to always be a part of the BioLays family. You guys are amazing. Um, the support that they provide you, Dennis, is amazing. You guys have these little clinical pods that get together and you have just, it's, it's just great. I love it. So I hope that you connect with me on social media. I hope that I see you somewhere. If you see my name talking about coding or management, I hope that you come to see me. And uh, with that, Joe, come on down. I'm, I'm done. I'm going to take Q&A when you're ready. All right. All right. Great content, Teresa. Um, lots of good stuff. And uh, we had a steady flow of questions while you were chatting away over the last hour. Um, I will start with, you know, th there were a lot of questions about, well, where can I find these templates that you're talking about? Where can I find the handout that you're talking about? Do you have a website? So what do you recommend? Should we send everyone to your website, Teresa? And then if if they need something specific from us, we can send them to Violet's uh, education. What do you recommend? Yeah. So, so first of all, I know that um, there is some, there are some templates that you do provide for certain procedures, but if you're looking for all over the place, then I would, um, I'm going to put in the chat, Duane Tinker is, I don't, he's dental compliance cop or something like that. Duane Tinker. And then also um, Andre Chardin, the crew process 
um, let me, I'm typing it into chat right now. They both sell clinical templates and they're fantastic. So Andre is a former Eagle Soft trainer. So if you're Eagle Soft, that would probably be really good for you, but you can always use it for other software. Dwayne Tinker is a former, um, he actually used to, he, they call him the compliance cup because he used to do the audits. He used to be the auditor of dental offices and he's, he came over to our side. Um, so he's fantastic. I think he's compliance cop. But anyways, I, I put that in the chat um, so that you can look that up. And then if for some reason it gets away from you, just email me. I'm happy to send you their way. Um, as far as my website, um, I don't have that information on there, but there's lots of other webinars on there. Um, some free, some paid, mostly free. And um, it's always being updated with events and uh, new webinars coming. Great. And uh, I've gotten a couple of questions about this particular webinar, if it's being recorded and it is being recorded. And if you just give us another minute or two, uh, I will review where you can find the recording at violates.com backslash webinars. And so you can definitely go and, um, and, and rewatch this and uh, re-scribble down notes uh, as you as you watch Teresa do her thing again. Um, so in essence of time, Teresa, let me just get a couple other questions in. Sure. Yes. Um, so there was one question about, um, you know, why are the carriers not paying for four quads of PSR in one session, even though this is supported by the literature? Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, I, I appeal those and I will say I probably I'm successful probably 50% of the time. And the reason I'm successful is because the literature shows it right so you can pull up studies um, where you can actually cite a study, um, you can bring in ex, uh, other factors and mitigating factors uh, maybe the, the patient's physician did not want you to stop their medication for two different appointments versus one. Perhaps the patient is very concerned with COVID exposure and only wants one appointment. Perhaps the person is morbidly obese, can't get in. Maybe there's caretaker issues. All of those are extenuating circumstances that I have been able to use to get things paid. Now, I've also not been paid with that, right? So um, what I will say, though, is that if you're trying to get that paid and you talk to the patient about how important it is to do four quads and how good, how much more beneficial it is for them. Your medically compromised patients will understand that and they'll be okay with going to bat to the carrier to get those benefits. Um, the other secret is that if the patient is upset about it enough, they go to HR and they talk to them about it and they're like, well, I don't understand that HR can get a claim paid. So HR can do that. HR has like the ultimate power. The employer has the ultimate power. And so I've had patients that have been really like the kind of patients that you know are going to complain. They go to HR and I got a check in a week. So it's it's definitely doable. Um, and for those of you who are not clinical in nature, what we're talking about is the fact that, and this is, I want you to tell your, your employees this because it's important for them to know this. When you do one side of the mouth, by the time you go home, by the time that patient pulls in the driveway, the bad bacteria is already reinfecting that clean area. So it's like, why am I waiting a week to do this? It's like, why am I doing that? It, it makes no sense, right? The literature supports whole mouth disinfection, right? And that's why when you talk to the patient and you tell them that, I don't know how many patients are going to be like, oh, yeah, I'm good. Let's do one at a time and separate it by two weeks. I don't care. I don't think you're going to get that. So, okay. Hope I answered that. Great. Yeah. Um, so what I'm going to do, Teresa, is I'll ask one more question, um, but you've definitely gotten chatter going here. So we have a lot of good questions that are that are listed. So uh, for all the attendees, what Biolase Education will do is uh, we'll ask one more question, then we'll wrap up. I will send Teresa um, the list of questions for her to answer. And um, we will uh, get back with you on the answer to your question here in the coming days. So um, the last question that we'll touch on is there was a question when you were on the slide uh, about gingivectomy. Mm -hmm. uh, so the question was, why would you need attachment loss for a gingivectomy if not needed necessarily due to perio? I know. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. I know. But when I look in the provider processing manuals and that's what the guidelines are, that's what they have. And I, I got to say, I think it's just because it's one of those things where that code just happens to be in the fours. And that's a typical guideline um, that that they have for that. So um, just real quick, Joe, I just want to tell you something that that kind of supports that point. 
sometimes there's just global coverage for certain categories. And, and one thing that I've been seeing a lot more is if you do a flap in one quadrant, within um, two years, if you do any scaling, root planning, or osteosurgery in that quadrant, it's denied because of a frequency limitation. That's really absurd because you may have done a flap on number 12, and then all of a sudden the whole mouth, you know, the whole left side is just a mess. So you're going to do scaling and root planning because you did that one flap. It's not going to get benefited. That's a pretty extreme cost containment measure. So when I saw somebody say, I like the firm conversations, I'm telling you, you will get better and better at it. Firm conversations are what we need. Great. Thank you so much, sure. uh, Teresa. Thank you.